Good. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for waiting <laughs> for me this time. It's a, it's a pleasure to have uh, you here from MIT. Um, we, we didn't meet before, but no? we met through virtual reality yes. and got introduced by um, somebody from the Swiss Institute of, no, the... GDI. GDI, yes, the... Yeah. Gottlieb Institute. Yeah, yeah. Um, where there was a, a seminar on, well, the, basically the future Earth, how, how the Earth should look like in a digital age, I would say. Uh, and then you came good. up as somebody who is doing that and doing that with really interesting means. And then we thought, well, this fits exactly what we're trying to do in the cluster. And we have all these connections to MIT anyways through Ian's group. So it's a pleasure to have you here. We're really glad to interact with you and learn about the exciting stuff that's happening in your lab and at MIT. OK, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, what I would like to do today is talk about collective emotions. And what we have been doing at the Center for Collective Intelligence is studying how people interact. And what I'm most interested in more recently is happiness. And one of the insights of happiness is you can basically be the happiest person on earth but if you are Robinson Crusoe and you sit on an island, you will not be happy. Which means you need others and interacting with others. And how is that interaction happening? And that's our area of research. And you see here the three means of communication, because interaction means communication, that our team has been studying. It's online social media and my personal background goes back to 1991, which tells you how old I am, uh, when I was a postdoc at MIT in the networking group, just building computer networks. And since then, I have always looked how people interact. And when Twitter and Facebook came along, they give us a great way of measuring how sending one tweet of making America great again triggers a lot of emotions in many other people. And now these days we throw a lot of machine learning and deep learning and all of those great wonders of computer science and statistics at trying to, you can call it predict, but it's not really true because when sometimes uh, uh, I say I'm predicting the future, but what I'm really predicting is the past because you can only take patterns of the past and hope that they will be applicable again in the future. And so that's what we do when we look at whether um, um, Elizabeth Warren or somebody else might become the next US president based on some tweets. So online social media is one thing. Another one which we have been studying also for 15 or 16 or 17 years is taking email to increase organizational creativity. And whenever I say that, particularly in Germany, the first reaction is privacy, and that's really spooky. But um, it has taken us a long time to figure out how to do this. I will share the secret with you that we are still allowed to work with German banks and study email and actually try to construct what I call the COIN or collaborative innovation network and the point about coins is that they are about anything but coin. It's about intrinsic motivation. And then we are back to emotions again, trying to read those emotions, how people interact with email. The last um, um, channel that we study is face-to-face. -face. Originally with my colleague Sandy Pentland, using sociometric batches that you put around the necks of people that measure through infrared whether we are facing each other, that measure through Bluetooth how close you are, that measures through accelerometer how much we move around, and that measures through microphone whether we take turns. Again, we are not recording the content. We are just recording the emotions. And who is speaking, and that tells you a lot. Now these days, because smart watches have become really popular, we don't need the sociometric badge anymore, but we use um, mostly Android watches right now to study initially happiness. And that's the happy meter that I'm wearing here that 
will tell you if I would share my screen right now that I was a bit nervous, that um, I was somewhat stressed, but I'm still happy to be here, and I will be even happier once I have finished the talk. So um, those uh, are things, emotions, individual emotions, but they all come from the interaction with you. And that means if all of you would be wearing the happy meter, we would know even more. And now we are also using face recognition. We are not doing it in the way of the Chinese government, where we are looking that Martin and Karin and somebody else are sitting here. We are only interested in the emotions. And so we will get collective emotions from facial expressions or from voices. Because then you don't have to wear the, the watch. It makes things a bit easier. So what I'm going to cover today, talk a little bit about happiness as the emotion that I find most exciting and trying to increase happiness um, in large groups. That's something which I think is really interesting and worthwhile. Um, we have started with happiness of people, but now we are just applying the same facial recognition libraries to happiness of horses and dogs. Um, it's a bit of a programming challenge because we are not really deep learning machine learning experts and you have to change those libraries because, uh, for example, the dog nose looks for a machine learn library like uh, human eyes. So you have to make some changes to that. And um, now we are even trying to see whether we can get some happiness of plants. Um, but the, that's not the topic of today. Um, the main topic is what I call the social compass. And the social compass is basically intuitively very simple to understand. It tells me how I should behave and what others think about me. But building that is awfully complex and all of the systems and um, algorithms I'm going to present to you today, they fit together into that social compass on all the three layers. Whether it's making America great again on Twitter, or um, studying organizational communication on email, or these days it's also things like Slack or WhatsApp and so on. Although we can thank um, Cambridge Analytica for making Facebook um, close that system a lot. We could perhaps still hack some of it, but uh, I mean, at MIT you have some very good hackers. We are not trying to do that because it would not be legal. Um, and then we have the facial and other body um, signals that are the most interesting. The closer we can get to the human body, the more we get and learn about emotions. And the most fascinating emotion, in my view, happiness, and the point here that I would like to make is that going back to the Greek philosophers, there is two types of happiness. And one of the happiness, the, the lower happiness is sort of cheap. You can just buy it by buying new stuff. If you have a Maserati, you might be happy for a few months and then you need a Rosers and then you need an A380 and so on. So this is not really sustainable. And then there is the higher happiness, and higher happiness has all to do with how we interact with each other. And that's what we think is, interact, uh, is interesting. And interacting with each other basically means knowing what um, others think. And speaking about collective emotions, all of us have experienced that. I'm old enough to remember the day when Diana died, and that was a day of global mourning. And it was very clear for everybody what the other person on the street was thinking because the death of Diana was such a sad thing. That means we had collective um, sadness. I was in Boston when the marathon bomber was um, bombing the Boston Marathon, and that was a day of collective fear. And again, that was horrible, by the way. I was in my house, locked in. The, only the army was in the street. And 
nobody could do any work anymore because we were so glued to Twitter. Because Twitter was the best means of communication in those frantic two days. And I mean, it was really around MIT. He was, some MIT police officers were also killed by the Marathon bomber. And it was just fear, fear for everybody. And then, more recently, you can get collective anger, like when Mr. Trump decided to um, uh, skirt around Congress and find other ways of building the wall. And that triggered a lot of frustration in places like Massachusetts. Or it triggered a lot of joy in places like Alabama or some other red states. And what that tells you is that the way how somebody responds to external events with what types of emotions will tell you who you are. That means if I can read the emotions of the people around me one way or the other, and I have already shown you three ways, social media, email, and facial expression with some measured with whatever type of sensor you have, you will know how others respond to you. And that's basically the idea, because if you know the emotional reaction of groups of people, you will know to what virtual tribe they belong. We will talk a bit more about virtual tribes. Together with CDI, we have been building a tribal recognition system that takes large um, uh, corpora of text and then based on shared language. It will tell you your belief system because if somebody gets a novel claim, um, and Mr. Trump is a master in creating new claims, and then it's either an alternative reality or it's the reality that somebody believes. And so depending on whether my peers, the group I'm in, um, shares my emotional reaction, I accept it as truth, or I do not. And the way to explain that is the moral foundations. And there is a lot of research about moral foundations. And we have been doing studies about moral foundations using um, two frameworks. One is the Schwartz value system. The other one is by a psychologist um, who look, does a lot of happiness research named Jonathan Haidt. And depending on your moral foundations, you will either believe something or you will say this is fake news. And trying to read those emotional reactions will tell you in what of those digital virtual tribes you belong. And the way to read those emotional reactions in a positive way, that's the goal of the social compass. And basically, if you have a nice person, and a nice person basically means they care about other people, who is confronted with not, not very nice person, or you can also, to put some very black and white words, have an altruistic person interacting with an egoistic person that will first make the nice person unhappy, but in the end it will also make the other person unhappy. So trying to create a system where we have people caring about each other will make all of us happier. How can we do that? And that's basically the big vision of the social compass. We take our different media sources, the, and that, because of time reason, I cannot really go very deep in what sort of algorithms we are using here. Um, it's all extremely well documented in 200 papers or so on our website. We are looking at how quickly re people respond to each other on Twitter. We are looking at how positive or negative um, or disgusted and so on they are. We do the same thing with email and we look whether people are facing each other, how quickly they respond, what's the emotional tone when they are speaking, and that's all things that the happy meter can automatically calculate. It's basically emotion rec recognition through voice. 
And then we get a long list of parameters, variables, that we can feed into our machine learning systems. We have coined something called the seven honest signals of collaboration, and that's things like speed of response, uh, things like central leadership, which basically, if you are familiar with um, something called social network analysis, which is basically um, a, a mathematical way um, um, established in sociology of measuring how people network with each other. And you can either have central leaders or you can have decentral leaders. And it turns out if in a group you take turns in being central and decentral leaders, that's a predictor of creativity. And the point is that in the end, I do not have a network where Peter interacts with Martin and Martin interacts with Karin. I just have a bunch, I have a vector, a vector of numbers that deals with GDPR and the privacy questions that describes my properties. That's those seven honest signals. That's the emotions, which again, I'm, if I would look at email, I would not see whether Peter is looking at sex websites. I would only get an emotional vector where I have my level of disgust is 0.5, my level of anger is 0.3, my level of joy is 0.7, and so on, which is very neutral and privacy respecting. And then we have a third thing, and that's, I've already alluded to that, the virtual tribes. And I will talk a little bit more about that. That measures, for example, how much I think that making America great again is great. Or putting it in other words, am I a fatherlander? Meaning, I think God and fatherland is really what matters. Or am I a tree hugger? Which means I'm a more, I need to protect the environment. Am I um, a nerd? Which means technology will solve all the problems. Am I a spiritualist? And what we have shown is that the language that people use will define to what sort of tribe you belong. And so, again, that system will just tell you Peter is 0.7% um, uh, um, nerd, 0.3% tree hugger, 0.01% fatherlander, and so on. And this is, again, additional input into the machine learning system to then predict the parameters that will go into the social compass. And the first thing we can do, I mean, in other words, in other words, and that's now where it might be a little bit spooky. If I wear that watch, if you have access to my mailbox, if you have my Twitter feed, you can say whether I'm introvert, extrovert, agreeable, consensuous, and so on, meaning that's the big five um, uh, personality characteristics. Or you can say, using the Schwartz value system or the Jonathan Haidt um, uh, fairness scale, whether I am I value tradition or whether I value um, fairness. Um, what are my moral foundations? So, and that's basically the vision of the system of the social compass that we are trying to build. And um, now I will go a little bit more in depth and talk a little bit about the middle layer and those components that we have developed on the global layer taking online social media on the organizational level with email or Slack or those sorts of um, communication media and on the interpersonal level with the happy meter. So we have created a system to find the fatherlanders and the tree huggers and the nerds based on the vocabulary of tribal leaders. For fatherlanders, we take Mr. Trump, we take Boris Johnson, we take all of those tribal leaders, and they are not, they tweet a lot. So we can just look how they are speaking, and then we take a machine learning system. And we feed a few hundred the tweets, the language, the words of a few hundred tribal leaders into the machine learning system, and out we get a keyword vector that will, if it's matched with my own tweets, tell me how much. I am a fatherlander. And this can be applied to um, any uh, person 
you can basically take your vocabulary. Um, there is an online system uh, at the very last slide. You will see the web link to try it out for yourself if you have a Twitter feed. But um, it also works with email or with other um, text that you produce. This is basically just the architecture, how it works. I don't think um, I will go into great detail. Um, the idea is that you take deep learning and an algorithm called LSTM to train the system and then finding the words that are most descriptive of, for example, my own tweets. So I'm sharing here my profile, but actually you could look at that online. And you could look at anybody else's profile also online, and then you would see whether somebody is a fatherlander or a tree hugger or a spiritualist, whether it's a risk taker. I mean, another um, uh, system which we think is also interesting is we wanted to find out whether people say the truth. And so we were thinking, what are, what is a tribe? of people that is perhaps not saying the truth, but always lying. And we thought it might be the politicians. They are not paid to say the truth. They are paid to say whatever their voters want to hear. So we took the Twitter feeds of all the members of Congress and the senators. And then we took the, some population of people where we thought they might be paid to more or less say the truth. And we took the journalists of The Guardian and The New York Times and The Washington Post and so we are not saying you have liars and you have truth sayers, we are saying you have politicians and you have journalists. And then you can see whether somebody talks like a journalist or whether somebody talks like a politician. And so here we have a politician and he will talk very differently. Because he's a big fatherlander. And by the way, if I would hear, um, I'm not going online right now because uh, it would probably take too much time. Mr. Obama is also a fatherlander. You cannot become, an, and even Bernie Sanders is a fatherlander to some extent. You cannot be a politician without not being a fatherlander. But that's, I'm happy not to be a politician. Um, what we also um, have shown is that the different <coughs> categories of calculating those feature vectors for describing a person are very orthogonal. That means here, for example, we have matched the tribes with the seven honest signals, which is like how quickly are we responding to each other. And that speed of response you can measure either with Twitter, you can measure it with email, and you can measure it with the happy meter. Because it will measure whether I'm shutting up, whether it's my voice that speaks, or whether it's somebody else's voice that speaks. And that's all we are measuring. Then the emotional, we are using machine learning and training it. There is uh, some uh, training data sets for emotionality of voice. And then we are also uh, capturing that. So this is the global way of trying to understand the person. We also do it with email. The trick with email is to make data only recognizable to the individual that it is, um, that's being analyzed. And that means whenever we do a project with a big company, and now we have worked with companies like Ford or ExxonMobil or some very big banks, also in Germany, and the deal is always, and the Betriebsrat has bought into that, that the manager will never know what we find out. Only the individual person will get the result of their individual analysis. And this looks then like such a dashboard where you see in the language of the honest signals, in the language of the social compass, who you are. And at the same time, we calibrate the system with the dependent variable which is the performance variable of the company. So in that dashboard, the, this person will see how quickly others are responding to them. And we have shown that happy people answer email faster. So for example, just 
The speed of response is a predictor of happiness, but it's also a predictor of passion and respect. If Peter sends an email to Bill Gates, who cares? If Bill Gates answers my email three minutes later, it wasn't Peter that sent the email. It was probably Barack Obama or Warren Buffett or some other really famous and important person, but the point is the faster people respond to me, the more they respect me. And the faster that I respond to all the emails, the more passion I have. So speed of response is also a proxy for passion and respect. And that's the sort of thing that we tell the people. And then they will they get some eye-opening experience. And they can either say, that's bullshit, or they can say, I want to change. And we have done those virtual mirroring exercises. Um, this is an example with an Indian outsourcing company with 70,000 employees, with whom we have working, uh, been working for eight years now, using all three of our systems, the social media analysis, the email analysis, and the happy meter, to increase customer satisfaction. And what we have been able to show here, and I call that the Heisenberg effect, because if you measure a system, you change it, and hopefully for the better, just like in quantum physics, is that if people know how they should communicate to get happy customers, they will change their behavior. And the customers actually become happier. And we have used an external dependent variable, so, I mean, you could just use our own sentiment analysis, but sort of, uh, we would have a big uh, collusion problem. But um, we used something called Net Promoter Score, which is asked directly um, from an external um, um, evaluator, um, how likely are you to recommend um, that particular company? And that was the dependent variable, and they have been tracking that for um, de a decade now. Every half year, they are doing those big surveys. And in this company, they have 70,000 employees. They have 240 large companies. Those would be companies like Deutsche Bank, for example. And the company, uh, the accounts or the teams of service providers from that big Indian company that got virtual mirroring, their customers over the observation period of almost a year, they increased satisfaction by 5%, whereas the others that didn't get it, they decreased satisfaction by 12%. So you can say that by doing this virtual mirroring, we got an increase in satisfaction of 17%, which really means that if you measure a system, if you tell people how they should change their behavior, they will change. Now, of course, you can question whether it's the Hawthorne effect or the Heisenberg effect. And I think we will need to do much more projects. And that brings me to the last way of measuring satisfaction with the happy meter, because that really gives you the most direct way of measuring satisfaction. And what we have done here, we take the sensor readings of the watch and we have used something called experience-based sampling, where at the random time per day, four times per day, the watch vibrates. And then it asked, I, I recruited 100 students to wear the watch for three months, um, their happiness. And that was the basic training data set. And the project has now been going on for three years. We have about about a thousand people in the meantime have worn the watch for a longer or shorter periods of the time. We have gone through three iterations. We started with the Pebble watch, which we really loved. It's very sad that it went out of business. Then we used the generic Android watch, and right now we use the Android Wear watch. It works with any Android Wear watch. And it takes that data from the watch. It will transmit it to my smartphone. From there, it goes to the Amazon cloud. There, the machine learning system runs <coughs> and creates a prediction, and that's shown back to me on the watch. <coughs> I could also look at it in real time on the website. So <coughs> I can always get access to my happiness, and the question is, does that increase my happiness? Now, um, 
We have done some interesting experiments. Uh, this is a theater in the Landesmuseum in Zurich, where we were combining the happy meter with facial recognition, where we put a very cheap web, uh, a Logitech webcam for 100 francs, um, just and it would look at your face, and then it would tell me what you think about me, just based on your facial expressions. And then we have combined that with the happy meter readings of the actors. The actors were wearing the watch, and we already found some very interesting insights. For example, that um, the happiness of the actors and the audience were negatively correlated. And when the, the actors were really sad, the audience was really happy. <laughs> but it seems, I have spoken with some uh, theater professor about this, that seems to be a well-known effect. I didn't know this, but um, just, just, know, just knowing what's going on here will already change your mood. And let's hope that uh, by and large for the better. I mean, that's some of the things that we are trying with that social compass in the long run. Right now, there is one very safe way of increasing everybody's happiness. Give them a puppy. If you have a little dog, you're happy. Now, what we are doing, we are also studying dog faces. I mentioned that already. And we built that system, which um, it was really hard to, to port it from recognizing human faces to dog faces. And then it will um, predict that we are working right now uh, on horse faces because horses and dogs they are the most in sync with over the course of evolution they have really we have become very um, uh, good in reading each other's body language and the final vision and that's the slide which with I would like to close is basically to combine that system um, and also integrate external factors. External factors on the one hand is things like sunlight, like the weather. It turns out that if we look at happiness just measured with the watch, more than 50% of my happiness is the weather forecast. So now we always take the weather forecast from the smartphone because we know where you are. And Google gives you a very accurate weather forecast, and we add that to the model. And this is already um, good enough to give us a very high accuracy. We want to add more features, like lighting effects. <laughs> Philips, now called Signify, is disclaimer, one of the major sponsors of our work. And they want to know how they can increase happiness by um, changing the lighting. And another very safe way of increasing happiness is if you are in nature, influence of plants. So that's another of our areas of research. Thank you very much.